there, there's nothing that girl can't sing. You know that, right? It's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. That's so good. So good. Let, let's pray. Lord, help us to get in the deep end, to deep end of your love and of the adventure that you've called us to. God, give us courage to be the people that you want us to be, to make the impact that you want us to make. Lord, I know that we've gathered here together, here in this room and at home, because we want to be difference makers for your kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray that we'd have some aha moments, that we would start to see how we can make an impact, and we could find, Lord, your pathway uh, to lead in a life that does make a difference in the lives of others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody here today. I'm so glad that you're a part of the Sagebrush family. Welcome everybody in the room. Welcome everybody at home watching on TV. I want to welcome all the multi-sites all around New Mexico, our campus all the way out in Belize. And I also want to welcome those who are incarcerated who watch us every week in hopes that Jesus isn't done with them, friends. Jesus is never going to be done with you. Can you welcome everybody, would you? It, it's hot in here, isn't it? It just feels a little bit warm. You know, I, I, I appreciate some of you giving love to your pastor. I appreciate it. I heard booze. I heard booze as well. And again, I'm going to drop a scripture bomb at you, okay? Haters going to hate Proverbs 9.8. Look it up. For some of you, that's your life first, okay? Stop it. Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice. <laughs> Just rejoice with me. Man, come on. I waited 50 years for something like this to happen. It's ridiculous. Just re give me another 50 years before we get back there again. So just, just rejoice with your pastor, would you? Hey, friends, we're starting a brand new series today. It's just this quick little series. It's just two parts. It's all about Esther. There's a little book in the Old Testament about this woman who has unbelievable courage. And she allows God to use her in ways that she never imagined that she she would be used. And I hope that you'll come back next week for the conclusion of this series. You, you don't want to miss it. So we're going to talk about courage today. And I came across a story about a very courageous woman. Maybe you've heard this story before. Her name was Irina Sindler. Irina found herself living in Poland during World War II. Uh, this was when the Nazis invaded Poland. And one of the first things that they did was they gathered the Jewish people together and they placed them in a concentration camp that they called the ghetto. Well, Irina knew that these people were never going to get out. She knew what the Nazis were doing to Jewish people and she thought someone needs to do something and she looked to herself to figure out what she could do. Now, the problem she had was she couldn't get into the ghetto because she was a social worker. She didn't have the appropriate credentials. So somehow she works the system out where she gets the credentials of being a nurse. And then her, along with several of her friends, start smuggling into the concentration camp medicine and food to help those people out. Well, she's doing this day after day after day. And she's talking to the parents of these children. There are thousands of children in this concentration camp. And one of the things that she hears from the parents over and over again is the desperate need to get their kids out. They say, you know what, we know that we're probably never going to get out, but if there was just a way we could come up with that we could get the children out of this concentration camp. And so she began to think through what she could do with that. And so here's what she did. As impressive as it was for her to smuggle in medicine and food, what was more impressive is what she smuggled out. She would sedate the children under the parents' permission. And she had these toolboxes that were large that were made that had a false bottom. And she would lay the child and put the false top on chops so the Nazi soldiers couldn't see the children. And then for other children, she would put them in burlap sacks and tie the burlap sacks. She would sedate them as well. And she would pile those children up in her truck. And then she would pray in hopes that the Nazi soldiers wouldn't you know, go through her truck and, and find the kids that she was smuggling out. Friends, she did this day after day, week after week. All told, she smuggled out over 2,500 children. Now, that's tremendous courage, wouldn't you say? It's amazing. 
It's amazing. And here's what she did. She worked with a Christian orphanage. And when they got to the Christian orphanage for those kids, they would change the children's names and they would give them a brand new identity. And she had a ledger where she would write the child's name that it was before and what the child's name was now. And then she would write down the family that the child belonged to. And then she hid the ledger in her backyard in a hole in the ground that she had dug. Well, she did this day after day, week after week, month after month. Eventually, she gets caught. She's captured, and they're not pleased at all with what she has done. And they beat her, they tortured her, they broke both of her legs. Eventually, the war was over, she was released. Do you know what this woman spent the rest of the days of her life doing? Reallocating, refining those children and connecting them once again back to their families. That, my friend, is a life well lived. And I think that's what all of us want. We want to say that we made a difference, that we made an impact with our one shot at life. And for us to do that, it's going to take unbelievable courage. And that's what we're going to look at in this little book of Esther. This woman was such a courageous person who stood in the gap for her people and did what needed to be done. Now, for us to understand the, the book of Esther, we got to understand what it, where it comes up in the timeline of Israel's history. So let me give you a quick little history lesson. Israel was made up of 12 tribes. They had a civil war. Ten of the 12 tribes went to the northern kingdom. They retained the name of Israel. Two of the 12 tribes were the southern kingdom. They retained the name of Judah. Well, if you know anything about the Israelite history, you know that they did what was evil and wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And God allowed the Assyrians to come in against the 10 tribes of Israel. And they were obliterated from the face of the earth. If you've ever heard the phrase, the lost 10 tribes of Israel, that's where that phrase comes from. They were annihilated from the face of the earth. So there's just a remnant of the two tribes that's left. Well, guess what? Judah did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord as well. And God allowed a king by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, Babylon to come in and invade them. Now, here's what King Nebuchadnezzar would do. He would take the brightest, youngest people that, the, that Israel had to offer and he would deport them and bring them back to Babylon to indoctrinate them into the Babylonian way of life. So the stories of Daniel, the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the stories of Esther all happened during a 70-year period called the exile when the children of Israel are exiled to Babylon. Now, 47 years goes by. The Babylonians lose power to a Persian king. The new Persian king allows a remnant of the Israel people, the Jewish people, to go back to their country and restart their country again. And there were several people that went and did that. But they've lived there for 47 years. And so some of these people had businesses. that They had uh, uh, set down roots. They had friends. They didn't want to uproot themselves and head back. And that's where Esther comes in. She's a foreigner in a foreign land. Now, for us to understand the story of Esther, you got to get familiar with the characters in the story. And we've made these drawings up as playing cards to kind of jolt your memory just a little bit. All right, The first one you need to recognize is a guy by the name of King Xerxes. King Xerxes. This guy is a drunk. I'm just going to tell you that right now. He is a drunk as a skunk, and he's also an idiot. All right, So we got a king who's a drunk idiot. That's what we've got in this story. Then we have two queens in the story. We have the Queen of Diamonds, which is Queen Vashti. And she is a very independent woman who uh, understands who she is and who God made her to be. You're going to be very impressed with Vashti. And then we have Queen Esther. She's the Queen of Hearts. She wins over the hearts of all of the people. Then we have a joker by the name of Haman. He is the villain of the story, and when he finally gets what's coming to him, you will rejoice when it finally happens. And then lastly, we have the ace in the hole. We have Mordecai, and this guy is going to be used big time by God, just like Esther is going to be used big time by God. All right, so we open up to Esther chapter 1, and what do we read? We find that the king is having a party. And when they partied in Persia, they partied in Persia. They partied like it was 1999. They partied all that time, partied all that time, party all the time. That's what they did. They just partied all the time. And this party has gone on. You ready for this? For six months. Six months, this guy 
has been in a drunken stupor. And the whole reason for this party is to show off how big and bad and impressive as he is. He wheels out all the gold that he's got, says, look how rich I am. Wheels out all the silver, brings out all of his soldiers, shows all of his different possessions. For six months, he's saying, look at me. Look how impressive I am. Now, ladies, one of the things you need to understand about a man is we like to show off. That's what we like to do. And we'll put ourselves in positions to show off to the ladies because we're in hopes that when the ladies see how amazing we are and what incredible athleticism we have, that they would immediately go, oh, and just fall in love with us immediately. So we'll put ourselves as guys in situations that we should never put ourselves in to impress the ladies. You don't believe me? Let me show you what I'm talking about. Take a look at this. notice when you see these videos, they're always of guys doing this stuff. You, you never see a, a, a montage of girls doing this stuff, right? Because guys are stupid. You understand that, right? Like you get a couple of guys together and there's a cute girl and the guy's like, you think I can do it? You think I can do it? And the guy's like, no, man, you can't. I can't. I can't. I think I can jump through the ring of fire. I think I can. No, nah, you can't jump through. Yeah, I think I can't. Pour gasoline on me. I'll show you what I'm talking about right now. Just pour it on me right now. That's a guy right there, right? He always wants to be impressive of the ladies. I remember when I was in elementary school, and, and my brother and I were riding bikes in the neighborhood, and there were some cute girls. He thought they were cute. He was about 14 at the time. They were out in the front yard, and he thought he'd just he'd impress them. He's going to do some bicycle tricks, and they're just going to be so blown away at his bicycle tricks that they want every one of them just marry him right there on the spot. You know, that's what, in his mind, he thought they're just going to think I'm the most incredible thing that's ever been. So he's doing all these little tricks, and he's quite impressive on his bicycle. But he's so enamored by the girls, he's not paying attention to what's in front of him. And there was a mail truck that was delivering mail, and he rammed right into the back of that mail truck trying to do a wheelie. It was awesome. I mean, he, he broke the fork of his bike. He hurt himself, gentlemen, in a place you do not want to hurt yourself. He's rolling around the ground. He's crying with everything. I'm crying, too, because I'm laughing so hard at what he's just done. It was epic, I tell you what. There's just something that God has put inside a guy where he just wants to show off. He wants to show off. This is what the whole party's about. He's just showing off what a big shot that he is. And then he thinks to himself in the sixth month of the party, he says, what's the greatest possession that I have? And he says, it's my queen. Don't you love that, ladies? She's a possession. And he calls for the queen to come out and prance her stuff in front of a bunch of drunken men. This is what the Bible says in verse 11. He wanted her to come out in order to show the people and the officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. Now, many commentators write that he wanted her to come out naked. <laughs> Boom, chicka, wow, wow. That couldn't have been better timing right there. <laughs> Who has that ringtone? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. I'm glad you're here in church. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> All right, we got to get it back together, friend. We got to get it back together. So most scholars believe that he wanted her to come out naked. You know, we're not thinking he wants her to prance out in one of those flannel PJ things that your wife comes to bed in, you know what I'm saying? And that's just wrong right there. Isn't that just wrong? Like, what, are you wearing a potato sack to bed? Is that what's happening? The Bible says anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. I'm just going to throw that out there right now for you. 
don't even know where that came from, to be honest with you. That just came up in my head. Well, guess what? She's not feeling it. She's not feeling it. She's like, I'm not coming down. I'll tell you what right now. I'm not going to do it. That's right. Now, this might surprise you a little bit, but there was a time in history when a woman's value was based upon only her physical beauty. Can you imagine a culture like that? That there was a time that young girls grew up looking at magazines and the internet and social media and felt like they were less than. There was a time when girls would go on strict diets and rigorous physical exercise and strut their stuff all in hopes that a gentleman might pay attention to them. Can you imagine a culture like that? That she says, I'm not going to do that. I like what Brenda McNeil wrote. She said, Vashti becomes a wonderful symbol to us of self-esteem and dignity and respect. Because she has decided that even though her husband may love her, he does not in this moment know how to value her. And so she says to the attendant, no, I decline. I respectfully refuse to come and parade myself in front of his party, his guest. I am the queen. I am a woman for whom people lower their gaze when I walk in a room. Men don't gawk at me. I will not come. Don't you love Vashti? Because she suggests that when people don't know how to value you, you still value yourself. When people, ladies, when people don't know how to value you, you value yourself. I'm the father of three girls, and I'm so glad that the Bible elevates the role of women in a culture that treated women as if they were property. I'm grateful that God shouts out through scriptures that a woman doesn't need a man to complete her but that she needs Jesus Christ to complete her. I'm grateful that a woman doesn't have to worry about the beauty of a physical appearance because the Bible says you're beautiful. It's It's that godly soul that God has placed inside of you, you know? Think about what she would have lost if she would have shown up to this party. She, she would have lost her self-respect. She never would have been able to look into the mirror at herself ever again over what she had done, how she had compromised herself in this way. The king is embarrassed by her behavior. Can you imagine? He should be apologizing to her. But he's such a drunken fool. He's embarrassed by her because she won't come and prance her stuff in front of everybody else. And so you know what he does? He doesn't apologize. He banishes her. He kicks her aside. He throws her out of the kingdom. Her integrity cost her a lot. But I think if she was here today, she would say it was a price worth paying. Because I have to learn to live with myself. I love John Maxwell's poem. He writes, I have to live with myself, and so I want to be fit for myself to know. I want to be able, as days go by, always to look myself straight in the eye. I don't want to stand with the setting sun and hate myself for things I've done. I don't want to keep on a closet shelf a lot of secrets about myself and fool myself as I come and go into thinking that nobody else will know. The kind of man I really am, I don't want to dress myself up in a sham. I want to go out with my head erect. I want to deserve all men's respect. But here in the struggle for fame and pelf, I want to be able to like myself. I don't want to look at myself and know that I'm a bluster and a bluff and an empty show. I can never hide myself from me. I see what others may never see. I know what others may never know. I can never fool myself. And so whatever happens, I want to be self-respecting and conscience-free. Vashti has great courage, and she leaves our our story with her integrity intact. Four years goes by. Well, guess what? He finally sobers up because it took him four years to sober up. And the king realizes how lonely he is and what a mistake he's made. 
And his advisors see his loneliness and they feel bad for the king. And so these geniuses come up with the plan. You know what the plan is? They said, hey, here's what we're going to do for you, king. We'll throw a, a beauty pageant. And we'll gather every beautiful woman in the kingdom and they will prance their stuff one by one before you. And whichever one you fancy the most, she will become the next queen. Now this is where Esther comes into the story. Esther is being raised by Mordecai. Mordecai is her cousin. Esther's lost her parents. We don't know what has happened to them. And Mordecai doesn't have a wife, or if he does, the scripture doesn't mention that he has a wife, or maybe she passed away too. So we've got this guy trying to raise this young girl. And I'm certain with the devastation of all the loss that they've had has caused her to mature beyond her youth, don't you think? She finds herself in this beauty pageant. She didn't volunteer for it. She didn't see some poster or some sign say, oh, I think I'll enter myself. I think I'm pretty pretty, to be honest with you. She's forced to do it. She was chosen by one of the king's advisors to be a part of the beauty pageant. See, she doesn't have a say in it because she's nothing more than a possession. And so she goes into this beauty pageant. And, and, and it's pretty, pretty uh, intense what they have them go through to get ready to prance themselves before the king. Let, let me ask the girls here a question just for a second. Just play along with the pastor. Raise your hand. Play along at home as well, would you? How many of you ladies have spent less than 15 minutes getting ready for a date? Anybody done that? Just put your hands up. That's impressive to me. Anybody else? 15 minutes or less. You still look beautiful. I know you did. Okay. Good, good for you. How many spent like up to an hour? Anybody up to an hour getting ready for a date? Just put your hand up real high. Up to an hour. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a little more extreme, but okay. That's what it takes. All right. That's fine. That's okay. Anybody take like two, three, four hours, get ready for a day? Oh, hello, hey, whoa, hey. It's like your wedding day, right? How many took a week? Anybody take a week to get ready? <laughs> yeah, you never look so good, and you'll never look that good again. That's just the way that it is. It's okay. It's all an illusion. That's what it is. It's all a... Yeah. How many of you just out of curiosity by a raise of the hands had more fun getting ready for the date than the actual date? Anybody? <laughs> Any and that went up, wow, let me tell you about it, I'll tell you. I want you to see what she had to go through to get ready. Chapter 2, verse 12 says that each woman had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments. Can you imagine, ladies? 12 months of massages? That's rough right there, I tell you what. 12 months of facials, 12 months of spa treatments, manicures and pedicures and all the other stuff, 12 months. Let's just say it for what it is. This was a hard year for Esther. It just was hard. It was difficult for her. Well, it comes time for the pageant. The Bible says in verse 17, the king loved Esther more than the other women. She won the favor and devo his, his favor and devotion so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. Then the king gave a great banquet to all his officials and ministers, and they lived happily ever after. It doesn't say that. <laughs> that would be Walt Disney. They did not live happily ever after. Why? Well, the king has a right-hand man. It's Haman, the villain. And Haman doesn't know that Mordecai is related to Esther. He, he knows that Mordecai is a Jew, but he doesn't know that Esther is a Jew. And we find out that Haman hates Mordecai. Now, why does he hate him so much? Well, the reason he hates him is that Haman kind of walks around strutting his stuff because he's second in charge, and he expects everyone to bow down before him. And so everywhere he goes, every room he walks into, every hallway, every time he's outside, people just bow down in reverence before Haman. And he likes that a lot. But here's the problem. There's one guy that won't bow down. Mordecai refuses to bow down. He says that kind of respect, that kind of reverence, that kind of awe is only for, the, for God Almighty, the creator of the ends of the earth. He's the only one that I will ever bow my knee to, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Haman hates him for it. And Haman doesn't just hate Mordecai. He hates everything that Mordecai stands for. And so he comes up with the plan. And he goes to the king in chapter 3 and he says, listen, these Jewish people, man, they don't respect you. They don't honor you. We've got a nation within a nation. We've got a country within a country. We need to wipe these people from the face of the earth. The king says, I had no idea. Okay, if that's what you think is best, I'll make a decree. It'll be open season on every Jewish person 
in a year. So he makes the decree, and the decree gets out to the people. Look at what happens here. It says, Mordecai hears about this. He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes and went out in the city wailing loudly and bitterly. In every providence to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. People are protesting in the street. What would you do? The president of the United States signs into a decree that it's open season on Christians. What would you do? You would demonstrate, you would weep, you would wail, you would call out to God. That's what's happening in this situation. And Esther sees the commotion in the street, but she doesn't know what it's about. And so she sends a message to Mordecai, and Mordecai sends a message back. And he says, listen, it's open season on your people. Could it be that God has placed you in this royal position for such a time as this? Esther is living in a royal bubble. She's so busy getting manicures and pedicures and facials and whatever else girls do on that kind of crazy. I don't know. I just know it's expensive. That's all I know. (laughs) She doesn't even see the needs outside her door. And so we got to ask ourselves the question, do we have ourselves in a royal bubble? Most Christians, they hang around with other Christians. They go to the Christian church, the Christian small group. They have their Christian friends. They listen to their Christian music. They watch Christian TV and Christian mu- movies, and they read Christian books. And they've insulated themselves. They've isolated themselves from the real world, and they don't see the needs around them anymore. Let me see if you're in a Christian bubble right now. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Notice I didn't ask you, when's the last time you invited somebody to church? No, when was the last time you told someone the difference that Jesus has made in your life? I mean, you see the spiritual darkness around you. You see these friends, these family members that you care so much for who are lost, who are empty, who are looking for meaning and purpose, and yet you won't share the difference that Christ has made in your life, the most important thing that's ever happened. Do you not see the need? How many times are you at your job? How many times are you at school? How many times you're frequenting a business and you see someone hurting, someone that you could meet a need, and you turn a blind eye? And you say, oh, I I, I don't want to deal with that. I don't need that drama in my life. We just want to stay comfortable, right? And, of course, comfort leads to complacency, and complacency leads to boredom. And that's why so many followers of Jesus Christ are so bored because they got themselves in a little holy bubble and to hell with everybody else. And yet Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, 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 no. You are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. How will people see your light if you hide it under a bush? And how will the salt make its impact if you don't get it out of the shaker? My goodness, we have to see the needs that are all around us. And Esther doesn't see them. Bob Pierce is the founder of World Vision. And he went to Korea right after the Korean War. And he saw all these Korean children in the streets. Their parents were dead. They had lost everything. They were starving to death. They would bring out food, but it was never enough food for the, for the need that was there. Miles of kids would line up. One day he's watching the drama unfold before his eyes, and he sees this child who's just so malnourished. And they've been standing in line for I don't know how many hours, and they finally get to the front of the line, and there's no more food. And the kid just drops dead of malnutrition right there on the spot. It shook him to the core of his being. And he said this, somebody needs to do something about that. Isn't that our typical response? Somebody needs to do something about that. We're always looking for somebody else to do what we need to be doing. From time to time, I'll get an email. I'll I'll get a letter that comes in. I'll have someone stop me when I'm out and about, you know, in, in the community. And they'll say, hey, man, I just want you to know, we need to do this. We need to do this. And I'll look at them and say, well, thank you so much for giving me more work than I already have. I really appreciate that. They say, no, man. They say, somebody needs to do something about this. This is wrong. This is, we need to fix this as a church. And I'll agree. Now, understand, if you do this to me, this is what I'm going to say back to you. Maybe that somebody's you. Because you're the one that's got the burr in your saddle right now. And you're the one that has the passion for it. And could it be that God has placed you in this position for such a time as this? My goodness, at some point in time, we've got to stop looking for someone else to do what God has called us to do. We've got to roll up our sleeves, and we've got to get in the game. 
So you know what Bob Pierce does? He doesn't look for somebody else to do what needs to be done. He says, I'll do it. He goes back to the United States, gets with these business people, starts raising money for Korea, bringing all the money back. He's buying all the food he possibly can, but the need is too great. He's getting ready to head back to the United States to do another fundraising thing for the Korean kids. And he meets a girl named White Jade. And, and White Jade, she's, she's just recently become a Christian. She's being persecuted. She's being tortured for her faith in Jesus Christ. And she's starving to death. All of his efforts and all of his money haven't made the dent that he thought it would. And so he pulls into his pocket and he says, I'll give you everything I've got. And all he had was a $5 bill. He handed her the $5 and he said, I promise you this month I'll send you some more money. And that became World Vision's child sponsorship program. That now helps millions of kids have food, have shelter, have an education, and they learn about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. And it all started with one gift of $5, and it just ballooned into something absolutely amazing. So here's my question. What will kill you if you don't do it? What will kill you if you don't do it? And too many of us don't have anything. What, 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 what excites you? What saddens you? What makes you pound your fist in anger saying someone needs to do something about this and I believe God has called me to do it. Take that joy, take that sadness, take that anger. Let it be your holy discontent to move you into action to be the hands and feet of Jesus. For Bob Pierce, it was getting food at the front of the line. For me, it was starting this church. I grew up in church. I hated church. My parents drugged me to church week after week. I had a drug problem when I was a kid. They just kept drugging me to church over and over and over and over and over. I hated it. Oh, it was all oh, so boring. And, and it was just a Christian country club. That's all it was. They didn't care about the community. They, they, they didn't start churches. They didn't start campuses. They, they didn't baptize anybody for four years. Listen, if you're not baptizing somebody in your church, you're no longer a church. You're a country club. When there's dust in the baptistry, you have ceased to exist for the mission of knowing Christ and making Christ known. I saw these churches that were dead and lifeless, and I thought, I don't want to be a part of that. And I think the church has the greatest message that God is for us and not against us. That he sent his son to die for us, taking the payment for our sin and paying that sin debt and rising again from the dead. The church should be a place where there's joy. Church should be a place where the people gather together for the mission and the kingdom of God. And friends, when the church is working right, there's nothing more beautiful on the face of the earth. Marriages are restored. <laughs> Prodigal sons and daughters come home. The lost are found. Churches are started. Campuses are planted. And God gets all the credit for it. What is in you that will kill you if you don't do it? Well, Esther has a choice. Get out of her royal bubble and do something or stay in a royal bubble. So what does she do? We'll find out next week. The question we need to leave ourselves with is, what are you going to do? You going to, okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> Stay in your royal bubble? Because a lot of us, that's what we're going to do. Or start being the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, here's your homework assignment if you choose to accept it. Start small. We always think big. We always think grand. Bob Pierce wasn't thinking big and grand when he gave the girl five bucks. But it sparked an idea that impacted millions of children's lives. And here's what the Bible says. If you're faithful in the small things, he will entrust to you even greater things. Listen, God always starts small. So what small thing can you do this week? What conversation can you have? What need can you meet? How can you be the hands and feet of Jesus? How can you be faithful today? And if you're faithful today, he'll increase your influence and your impact. And you'll look back on a life of making a difference for the things of God and for the kingdom of God. What will you do? What will you choose? This is the life that Jesus has called us to. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we got to have courage. we got to move forward in faith. We have to, Lord. 
We have to take the gifts and the talents and the passion that you've placed inside of us. And we have to do something more than look for somebody else to do what needs to be done. So give us eyes to see this next week, the needs that are around us, the people who are hurting, how we can help them with what you've given us. And Lord, help us to be bold about the difference that you've made in our life. Help us to see the spiritual darkness that surrounds our community, our family members, and our friends. And help us, Lord, to be the light of the world. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.